man there trying to stop Joe from getting himself into further trouble. Oh, it's not a bad ball for Pelly on the right side. It's Carlos Alberto. And what a great goal that was! Carlos Alberto! Maradona just walked away from Huddle then. Saldano. Austin. I'm Alex, your host, and I'm joined as always by Leon. Leon, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Sorry that you can't see me today. <laughs> Hope that works. Yeah, and we're delighted to be joined by Kira Carusa, who's a uh, footballer here in, in, in Denmark. Kira has played in, in the States and is now playing for Hobie Koo in, in the Danish Women's Super League. So, yeah, we're delighted to have you on the podcast. Thank you. Like I said, thanks, guys. I appreciate you reaching out, and I'm excited to just interview with you guys and talk talk soccer with you yeah sure so for to give our listeners a little maybe a little bit more background can you explain a little bit how you ended up playing here in Denmark but what was the kind of career path that you ended up playing professional women's football here yeah yeah so I uh, played collegiate soccer I played at Stanford University and then I played at Georgetown University and then I was drafted into the NWSL I got I was drafted to Sky Blue which is a team in and New Jersey, but I decided to go abroad, uh, mostly because of my Irish passport, just really opening up a lot of opportunities abroad. Again, getting called in with the Irish team, being abroad, it makes it a bit easier for travel and just convenience of playing out there. But more importantly, uh, the competition and just the growth of women's soccer in Europe, I really wanted to be a part of that and kind of jump on, see where that could go. So I played in France for about six months and lay off. And then after that, I came to Kru and played in the Danish league here. We promoted from the league under the Superliga. And then, so now we've been competing in the, in the Superliga for the last almost a year now, which is uh, pretty exciting. Mm-hmm. This team, uh, I think the thing that pulled me most to this, the project here in Kru is the, uh, the success it's had. And the people involved, Uh, the people involved are very, they want to, they have very uh, high expectations and goals for this team. They always saw themselves as being able to compete at the highest level, uh, even when other people didn't believe they could. And I saw that too. And so I am really excited that we're now in first in the Superliga and in qualification for Champions League and potentially the first ever uh league title for the club so mm-hmm. it's been it's been pretty good yeah and you on, on the weekend you beat Bromby right in second place so that yeah. was most that kind of like the biggest game of the season so far kind of a first few second clash yeah uh absolutely in terms of standings I mean that game uh it was definitely the biggest game so far I think though uh the way that the Danish league is set up this second half of the season every game is the biggest game of the season uh, you drop a few points here or there, and that basically determines if you get to qualify for Champions League or if you don't. So uh, it's it feels like every game's a final a bit, but yesterday especially, for sure. Mm-hmm. And I was reading a bit about Javi Co, like um, how they were trying to you know develop the women's team there, and a lot they made a big uh, stuff about getting into the Champions League and also putting the men's team on the women's team on equal footing. How does that kind of manifest itself in like in your in the in the squad? Do you really feel that there's like an ambition to the club and everything that it's pushing for? Oh, absolutely, and I think that uh, it's always been like that. That's what really drawn drew me to the club in the first place because this the club actually has done something that no other team in Denmark has ever done. 
since the creation of the women's program, it's promoted every single season, any possible point in which the team could promote into the next league, it has. And so now that we have officially promoted into the final league and to be in a contention for the first, for winning the league title, is something that no team in Denmark has ever done, uh, which speaks to, I would say, an ex- a perfect example of a manifestation of the mentality and the values that the club um, embodies and looks to, you know, uh, looks to uphold each day and with and through their teams is that they're always looking to improve and to be better and that no level of success is unattainable. I think sometimes people think, oh, you know, these things don't happen this quickly or you can, you can try, but like, trying is good enough. I think that with us in terms of us as players and the culture in this team and the environment in the club is that we don't just try to try, like we try to succeed and we try to win. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how has it been for you to move to Denmark and play football here in the middle, basically of the Corona stuff? I imagine it was like very, because you were playing last season in the first division and now in the Super League, what has it been like for you to kind of up your life and try and play professional football in Denmark in the middle of a pandemic. It's it's terrifying, uh, to yeah. be honest. I mean, in, incredibly hum, humbling, first of all, to be able to be playing, you know, doing your job, playing the sport you love professionally and having that opportunity to do that in during a pandemic. So very, very happy and appreciative of our league really taking those steps to make sure that we do that safely and are allowed to do that. But also just leaving your family, it's like one thing to move across to a different country or move across the world to go and uh, pursue this, you know, this passion of yours, but then to basically leave your home and say, okay, I may or may not get to see you in six months, just depending on what travel looks like, or even like my family, they can't even come to visit me in Korea and I would love them to experience you know a Danish league game and see me play professionally here and get to experience Denmark and you know everything it has but unfortunately with the way the world is right now they can't do that and uh that was kind of uh it's definitely something you had to consider before committing to doing this and uh yeah so that's been difficult for sure but at the same time it's just it's so rewarding. I would never change. I would never make a different decision and like not come to Denmark and not to continue to pursue what I love because ultimately I enjoy what I do every day. And especially here in Denmark, I think, I don't think that you can always say that, um, you know, you can always say that like, you know, you love your work, but, um, I do. So, and I enjoy the people I do it with. So, yeah. And was your family always super supportive of this this decision? Because um, I figured you you studied first, right? And then made the decision to to become a professional footballer. Um, what was their reactions yeah. when you when you when you chose? Yeah, so my family has always been incredibly supportive of uh, my decisions and what I'm doing. And even to a fault where I think, you know, I go to them and I question them like, you know, tell me if, you know, tell me if there's something to like, I shouldn't be doing this or like, tell me I'm wrong to kind of be a little, like a little selfish in my life. And like you said, I have I went to two incredible universities had opportunities in education and in the workforce outside of soccer uh open up to me but I choose to pursue soccer and some people think that's a little crazy and maybe it is who knows but um but ultimately I think why what my parents my siblings uh any of my family would say to me would be why wouldn't you they look at me a lot of times. I like speak to my my grandy is my grandmother, my Irish grandmother, and sometimes we talk about this and travel and being abroad. And she just always says, "If I were your age, I would do it in a heartbeat." She was like, "I would, I would do it for anything. I would do it while you can." Mm-hmm. And um, and yeah, so sometimes it's comforting to hear that because sometimes you can question yourself a bit. But I also know that my what I gained from my education and my schooling it's not going anywhere and uh, I still am growing and just becoming a much more well-rounded person with what I'm doing anyways Uh, and I get to I get to meet some really impressive uh, cool people who do some pretty uh, some very different things outside of the soccer world just in what I do right now uh, which I think is 
is pretty rewarding as well. So. Mm -hmm. And what was the point at which you kind of decided that you were going to try and make it as like make a pro? Was it late on in your college career or were you up to that point or what has this been kind of a goal that you've always had playing playing soccer? Yeah, I think in college, uh, definitely in my college career at Stanford, I I knew I wanted to continue doing this as long as I possibly could and my body would allow me basically, uh, mostly mm -hmm. because of when you when you find something that you love so much and like you give so much time and effort and like emotions physically, mentally, emotionally are so invested in. And I felt like such reward when you, when I did that with people who felt the same way and collectively eat day in and day out had this like purposefulness of, you know, coming in and training every day or traveling together or playing games together. It really, it showed me like a side of soccer that I knew that I didn't want to let go of and I didn't want to let go of for a very long time. And I yeah. am lucky enough to be in good health and in a position where I can continue to play. So uh, yeah, I always remember that. I, I think a huge thing for me is purpose and, uh, and I soccer professional soccer gives me such purpose each day. And so I don't want to let go of something like that yet. So, yeah, I mean, even on a way smaller scale, I kind of feel the same. Like ever since mm -hmm. football is back on in the amateur leagues here, it does give you like a meaning to get up and train during the week and to stay fit, eat healthy. Like even on the very smallest scale, which of course doesn't compare, it's still something that gives you meaning in a certain way. And then, yeah. So of course, lovely when you then can make it the essence of what Definitely. you do in your life most of the time. Yeah, especially right now where I feel like people are kind of, the pandemic and stuff like this having to sort of take uh take take stock and decide you know what is important in their lives and what kind of drives them and motivates them to keep going and stuff like this so when you when you you were playing in france before and then you come here to denmark like did did they sell you on this big project with fc or how did that kind of like opportunity come about as well also i know it's just like the team has got a few other um americans based in the team as well right so yeah, so when I was first told about it, uh, the uh, club is also has a, our general, our GM is an American and he's actually from Southern California where I'm from and I know him. So when he approached me in California about this opportunity here and the project, I immediately felt a bit of a connection just because I grew up knowing this coach and I, you know, trusted him and really believed in what he saw. And at the time when I was committing to come here, there was actually only one other American here. And uh, yeah, which was kind of scary because yeah. I had just come from a team with, you know, very, very few Americans in a different country, different cultures, different language. And you, you understand kind of the, what you're walking into and just being like, okay, am I ready to go into a different country and do that again? And uh, which is a little difficult, but at the same time, I did believe in the project. I believed in what he saw and how he kind of pitched it to me. And then once I did get here and COVID then hit, but later on in the summer when we were able to play, we brought in a few other Americans. And I think, and of course, like that makes it a lot more, it feels a little bit more comfortable when you're like, you can speak the same language with people yeah, of course for sure they like get the same jokes yeah. they read the news and they're like oh my gosh did you see what this happened in america all that stuff i know little yeah exactly plenty plenty <laughs> to be looking there at. there was stuff going but, on <laughs> um, and like little comforts yeah. in that but i have to say it's the day my danish teammates are the end all be all to why it's worked so well here i love the danish culture i think that the biggest thing that this club and the players in the, on the team have embraced uh, is the just like compromise between cultures, which I think for me coming in, I always was, that's the first thing I think about when I walk into a different country, I go, I am ready to learn. I am ready to teach my teammates as much as I can, as much as I, and that as much as I can learn from them. And I think that they too uh, thought the same way, their open-mindedness, their, uh, comfortingness mm. their understanding of that we've left our families and our home and to come and pursue this project in you know in their small town and what they're trying to accomplish in 
a league that has never seen them yeah. has never seen a club like this compete in uh I have to say that's been that's been everything truly like they've embraced us wholeheartedly mm. and it goes both ways and I think that actually speaks to much of our success as well as a team you and I both know that Co is quite yeah. a, a small place but for for our listeners like what would you what has been the kind of how do you feel that the town is really behind the women's team or what do you like what do you feel about the the place I love it I think it's very Hugo I think it's very cozy yeah, yeah it's comfortable <laughs> it's cozy it's it really provides you so much I so in my undergrad at Stanford we Stanford is this massive campus and basically the, the only way to get around is on bikes and like that's kind of like career like career is like you can jump on a bike on a, a lovely day like we have yeah. today and a lovely Danish summer day and you can get anywhere anywhere you need to be a supermarket to the field we used to bike to trainings last summer all the time morning trainings and evening trainings like whenever we could we would we bike in for coffee and uh what's funny is that last summer when we'd like bike into Kerr and like maybe pop in a coffee shop or something and someone would be like oh like you're American what are you doing here and they'd ask about the program they ask about us They're like oh that's really cool whereas now when we bike in like people will actually know us which is crazy and they'll be like oh we we would love to come to your games mm -hmm. like we see games are opening up like that's so exciting and uh people recognize how like good we are and which is awesome to feel that kind of like community support but also yeah. just a few weeks or just a few months ago we actually won um citizen of like the year they did like uh they did made an award of like who a crew citizen that they wanted to like uh kind of like give a you know recognize and give recognition to in the community and they said the hubiker women's soccer team and like our mayor came out and like presented us an award at the game and i think that just spoke to the fact that they they are so behind our project. Like they so, they believe in us. <laughs> yeah, that sounds super cool. Talking them um, maybe back to football, like what are some of the sort of style differences that you notice between playing football in the States and the playing it in Europe? I, I think I've read before that some people have said like maybe in America, some of the kind of more athletic side or something like that is more emphasized, whereas in Europe can be the more technical. Is there kind of been aspects of your game that you yeah. kind of changed or what's, what's been the kind of uh, adjustment to that? I think, yeah, you've said it pretty well. I, I think in America, especially in collegiate soccer and the Nebuchadnezzar physique and uh, kind of that like physical side of the game is really emphasized on. And you can see that in the way, I mean, the U.S. women's national team plays like these girls are are incredibly yeah. fit and tough, tough players to play against in terms of physicality uh and what i do say playing both in france and in denmark is the technical side of the game is very much more emphasized here not that it isn't in the u.s it's just that it's like i would say it's prioritized more here and for me as a player who has always been very a very physical player and um kind of like really embraced that american style of play it has me and improved my uh kind of soccer iq and my uh ability as a soccer player uh because suddenly not only did i need to be physical but i needed to be a bit more tactical on the ball or a bit more technical on the ball just because the game demanded it and our opponents demanded it and it's what and a lot of times you look at some yeah. of the most successful teams and the most successful players in this in the danish league and they're some of the most technical tactical very sound teams and I think that we like myself I again like I was like okay that's just part of the game the European game that I'm really going to have to embrace but also grow from because I'm not going to give up my kind of like physical um yeah yeah my competitive mentality Your sort of thing. Right, so. and also I want to and I love to see that like I can yeah, bring right. that yeah. to our team and the Danish the Danish players I play with can now also be like, wow, I'm really technical, but like that, you know, that like gritty bite, that like physical part of the game, that bodying people off the ball, that 90 minute player, like that's the, that's the soccer that they see. And they're like, I could learn from that too, which I think 
Well, it's 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 worked for you, yeah. right? Because you're the league's top scorer. <laughs> Fair, yes, it has. And I have to say, though, in college, I had a coach tell me we used to do, break down statistics and stuff. And um, by the end of my collegiate career, he says, "Kira, like you will score ninety percent of your goals in the box." Which, to be fair, as a ten or a nine or you know a, a far a forward player, you should probably be scoring from the box most of the time. Mm. Whereas but now playing in Denmark, I have really like learned to be a playmaker much more often. I've actually had to play in, in the midfield quite a bit and grown to enjoy that and really be successful there. But also like scoring from outside the box, just being, you know, technical enough to make yourself enough space and like take those shots and, and you know, give yourself that opportunity to, to uh, score kind of like a more technical sound yeah. goal in that sense. But um, so I find myself doing that much more often, which I think definitely helps when it comes to being the top scorer. Yeah. You got to be versatile. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, sure. yeah. So it's uh, it's worked out pretty well. You're right. <laughs> it does sound fantastic. Then you need to update the montage clip on, on YouTube because, of course, I went on YouTube before and checked the, the, the old goals and, and assists <laughs> one yeah. that, that is, it, it exists still there. But I think I don't think it's like up to date with the latest yeah. goals. That yeah, that's with. like that was more like collegiate. That was definitely my Stanford and Georgetown career, which um, now now that I think about it. I'm like, gosh, I've scored so many more goals and did so many more things since then. But uh, you're right. That should be updated. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I love the one where you were kind of in the penalty area, at the edges of the penalty area, towards the goal line, and then you tank two kind of uh, away from, from, from two of your opponents and then right straight to goal and shot it kind of in the bottom right I know, corner. No, the Marquette, George, it was about Georgetown. I remember yeah. that game. <laughs> so yeah. Very impressive, very <laughs> impressive. Know. Loved that yeah, one. Yeah, I, that was a game. Uh, we ended up winning that in double overtime, actually, and I had missed a PK earlier in the game, too. So yeah. just... You know, just like the memory of a goldfish. That's what I say forwards need to have. It doesn't matter if you missed the PK or scored it. You just have to forget it after five seconds and want the ball again, you know, so. <laughs> Be, being the league's top scorer, is that something that you care about? Or is it you going to give like the stereotypical footballers uh, answer and be like, no, nah, it's all about the team. I don't, you know, I'm forcing the records. <laughs> I mean, hey, I, I definitely say it's worth, it's worth caring about. I have to say that it's, it's not a, an easy feat to like, I don't, I'm humbled by it, but I'm definitely not sitting here going like, Oh, I don't deserve it. Or like, you know, it takes mm. a lot of, a lot of work and, um, and it takes a lot of belief from your teammates, you know, to like believe that like you're going to score, give you the ball in those opportunities. I mean, there are plenty of shots that you don't, you don't always make, or you don't always, or games you don't score in, but then the one game you can, you can get four goals out of or three goals out of it's just because yeah. people believe you know they believe that when you have the ball you're more likely to score so um I think it's I think it's uh I'm very humbled by it but I and I I feel proud of myself for being there um but I'm also I'm much more proud I'm proud to be representing like my club on that kind of scale like it's one thing yeah. you know to I to be at the top of the league to be like beating teams that have been success, like, you know, have gone to champions league for the last 20 years. But then on top of that, to have the top score of the league, I mean, it represents our club really well. And I'm really proud of that. Is this sort of underdog, uh, like status thing very much to kind of like you really embrace it, right? Or is it something very much kind of part of the team, the team culture for sure? Oh, definitely a part of our team culture. Yeah. And I think if you watch us play any game, it's that kind of extra, bite we have over other teams like especially in the beginning I, I'm pretty sure they projected our our team to uh be one of the ones relegated they were oh, okay. you know so they were like ah like Kubica or what are they you know, stick they, it up on the wall uh, in the dressing yeah room yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly and hey and we don't forget those things so um but I do I do always say this I think it's definitely what gives us our extra our extra gritty bite over other teams because when you play like these away games here in Denmark, when you're on a bus for, you know, four hours, five hours, jump off to play in a very, a final game, an important game to get three points out of, you kind of need that like crazy underdog chip on your shoulder yeah, to like come extra. out. Yeah, it's helped. It's worked so far. Leon, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, no, no, just because you, I mean, you, you're right now breaking kind of the duopoly of Brunby and Fortuna Hjöring, and I hope that I pronounced it kind of okay. Um, 
who've been yeah. who've kind of exchanged the trophies for over 20 seasons now or 20 seasons is that yeah so it's an incredible feat that this that this is working out and so successfully so kudos to that um and then yeah I, I, we touched on this earlier but kind of how important do you think this philosophy of the club that uh or the kind of the project that they are the same facilities the same staff and the same resources as they are for the men's team how how important do you think that was in in this in the story oh it's huge i mean some could say it's it's the story i mean besides like you know uh the successes of this team and the program of course but the a major pull for this program to pull the players that it has is this kind of like which is sad to say in 2021 this is a revolutionary thought but a revolutionary thought of concept of saying mm -hmm. when we recruit a player and we say facilities and uh you as a team are equal to that of the men's i mean it it really draws in players i mean for one at one point it, it people didn't believe it at all they don't laugh at you but when slowly but surely as people have kind of been reiterated that yes this is what we base it on this is what we pride ourselves on this is what we continue to do and it shows and then of course the success is helpful in that too um it's really kind of put this idea on a pedestal and has like shown to the rest of the league that it's important to both the community, the followers and the players that, that this is something that's up, upheld in the women's game. And I really think that, especially in Danish soccer, it's something that will, I think all teams will probably jump on, start using as well, because it's going to bring the Danish league entirely up to another level a very a much an even more competitive level yeah um forgive me if i'm incorrect you've extended your contract for another couple of seasons with for is it, that's great yeah. another three years right yeah so uh it's two years yeah but yes. as of the summer i'll be here for another two years yeah okay so yeah you must be like really excited to see what where this can go right like, yeah i mean i i guess i can't say it enough i believe in the project <laughs> and they sold it well from the beginning but um yeah, I have to say that the biggest thing was this club has always stood behind what they uh, what they've always told me, and yeah. they've always believed in me as much as I, I've believed in them, and they believed in this project as much as I believe in this project. And again, like that kind of purpose and that kind of like same page mentality is not something you always find anywhere else, or you can find that easily. So. It's not something I was willing to give up yet. Hmm. I wanted to also touch on, I know I'm conscious of uh, not taking too much of your uh, afternoon yeah. in the sun, but I wanted to also touch on on the representing Ireland. How did how did you feel when that, like you got the first call up and how you were actually, I'm actually going to, you know, get a call up for the national team? Yeah, it's, it's, it's like no other feeling. It's, it's electric. It's, it's terror. It's scary. Um, yeah. It makes you incredibly nervous, but only because of the, the kind of a stage that you're you're suddenly uh put on and the representation that you have on your shoulders like i felt yeah. not only for my family uh but for uh ireland as a country it just mm -hmm. it suddenly hits you really hits different <laughs> than anything else what did your what did your grandmother say to you when when you when you told her the news Oh gosh, I I think she's the one who told me the news. To be oh, honest, okay. <laughs> yeah. but she was the first person I call, and and I remember we spoke on the phone for hours, just, just talking about like just her and my papa and their story mm. of coming to America and like what they did yeah. and how, and her just going like, she did the me being able to do like being called up, me being able to be a dual citizen be, and be on this stage is only because of what they did and this yeah. and like what they went through and the risks they took so mm -hmm. for me like it's so humbling and special to put that jersey on and kind of like you know and just like be able to smile and just say that you know this goes beyond just a game or just beyond just wearing a jersey but yeah uh, it's more than just you right it's like a family yeah. legacy and yeah and yeah. and that's that's like that's there's nothing more that I could ask for than to be playing yeah. soccer at that with that kind of feeling. So, yeah, I it was ex, it was exciting and it still is exciting every time I get I get to go in and play and get to go in and play with the team. So.
what is Vera Poe like as a as a coach? You know, was she because she, she has a certain like uh, reputation. What was it like for you know the first training session and everything like that? Yeah, um, a bit different, but um, in the sense of like she definitely is very aware of like training load and understands that we all come from different teams, different training schedules and demands and coaching styles and games and. She really, uh, she really prides herself on being able to kind of navigate all of those with amongst all the players and find like a healthy compromise that works for each individual player. So a lot of planning before, uh, for before the camps, as well as for individual training programs for for the camp. Uh, yeah, so she's very particular and very um, and just mm-hmm. very, she's very prepared in that sense. Yeah. And, and do you feel like, because it's obviously quite an exciting time for women's football in Ireland with the team just missing out and qualifying for the Euros, but also looking forward to the World Cup, does that kind of atmosphere manifest itself in your experiences linking up with the squad and everything like that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. it's talked about amongst us. It's it's like you can't not talk about that. Like every single yeah. game, every training you get together is in preparation for that. So um, which makes it yeah, it's kind of cool to be part of this era of the, with the Irish yeah. national team of this, just every camp and every game is not just a training match or not just a like, hey, we're here to get together and like go play, blah, blah, blah. It's it's incredibly purposeful. It's incredibly, um, there's just this goal that's like, you can see it. So yeah. I feel I feel very lucky to be a part of the program or jump into the program a time like this Mm -hmm. and I think you definitely see it in the media it's like it seems to just like grow and grow from game to game and like the coverage gets bigger it gets bigger yeah more Irish people are becoming aware of it and actually you know getting excited and getting invested in it 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 is and you can really and you notice it amongst our team as well so um we love to see that it's a good thing it's always a good thing when the the publicity of it continues to grow. Leon, did you have anything else you wanted to cover just there? That I was just curious: is there any are there any lessons from eight B uh that you then bring into the to the Irish national team? Does it does it work that way, or is there anything that that, that you think gives them like in in a different perspective, maybe from Denmark? Yeah, uh, I think that if anything, I think the Irish. With the Irish uh, national team, it's always a mentality of kind of having a chip on your shoulder. And you're a gritty, hardworking, like dig in kind of team. So for me, coming from a team in Denmark who is really trying to embody those characteristics as well, it's exciting to for me to go and talk to my teammates and bring and see like so much the success of what that those kind of characteristics have brought us, and just remind us that like those are the characteristics that are like in our in our Irish blood, in our national team's blood, and that it brings success, and that uh, it's definitely uh, it's definitely something that we we should never forget or we should lean into more. So I think I think that's always cool to bring in, and like just I love to talk about you know kind of the successes of Denmark and how it's manifested in Denmark and how like that too is going to be with us in Ireland as well. Kira, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. Yeah, wish you. Uh, Good luck for the next. You've got five games of left, course. right? So, five more, five more wins, and the title is yours. Yep. How many people get to get to watch the games in the stadium? Right now, we're about half capacity, so uh, quite a few actually. But we're hoping by June. Uh, there's some new kind yeah. of uh, laws and protocols, COVID protocols that will be out. But hopefully by June, especially the Brumby game, June fifth, it's a, a full stadium of people. But if you guys are in crew let me know because i get tickets we have a game this thursday that would be absolutely fantastic um and of course you guys we would always love to have fans there and um you guys are always more welcome to come so yeah let me know thanks so much and yeah, no, definitely i have uh it's on the list of things i want to go get go see Good. a game as soon as possible. yeah that would be lovely i'll uh leave you to the have you got training today or is it like a rest day yeah yeah we'll head out i have some treatment and we'll have video and then training so yeah, a busy, a quite a busy evening, but you know, just another day of work. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, at least it's sunny today, so you get the oh. one day of Danish summer. So enjoy it. <laughs> it Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate yeah. you you talking with me again. It's very, I'm, I'm very humbled by that that you guys thought of me so thank you no no i'm humbled that you agreed to come on our <laughs> podcast so don't, 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 don't. of course don't worry about it of course we'll be in touch again soon take care yeah thank you so much best of luck